and we are live <laughs> now we're working now we're cooking with gas uh yeah welcome welcome um here we are this is the second of uh probably four i think sessions that we're going to do on this this topic um i hope you guys are excited for this one i sure as hell am um and if you're not, you damn well should be. Uh, we've got some very, very cool stuff coming up in this one. Um, really getting to grips with some of the case studies and some of the the proof of the of the pudding of uh, some of the tactics that we we started to introduce um, in the last session. So with that, let's crack straight on and get right into uh, the uh, Biohacker's Guide to Fly Fishing Part Two. Um, so if I just pull up the the PowerPoint here, so I can see what we're how we're doing. There we go. Uh, yeah, just to reiterate very quickly from the last session, uh, there's this one big idea that we're trying to base everything around. And very simply, that is, I think that we've sort of been missold a lot of what the the mainstream or the conventional wisdom we have around fly fishing, which kind of suggests some things that they're useful when you get further down the line, but it's not the best way to start out learning about fly fishing. So learning lots and lots of names of fly species, um, tactics, and just learning facts by, by rote, it's, I don't think it's the best way forward, certainly for catching fish at least. Instead, what I think, if you can learn a smaller number of basic rules that are based on the actual biology of the interaction of the fish with your fly, then it saves you, it cuts out a lot of the legwork of learning things and it's super, super effective and it allows you to pick up this system and use it anywhere in the world. So it'll serve you really, really well on any river that you turn up at. Um, and that's that's really what we're sort of trying to um, put across in, in these sessions. So, and again, I've co-opted <laughs> controversially in some quarters <laughs> um, the term sort of biohacking of fishing. And really all I'm saying is I'm defining it here. So I'm explaining how I'm using this word. It's basically you're sort of hacking or tweaking the, the responses, the natural evolved responses of fish in the same way that a computer hacker might manipulate an operating system. Only in this case, we're, we're working with a kind of a living creature. And what we're doing is we're, we're getting it to respond to an artificial imitation uh, fly as if it were a real insect. So that's that's the conceit, really, with, with um, using that term. And th there's nothing more or less to it than that, other than it's a really convenient shorthand way of referring to that. So as soon as I start talking about it, it's easy to grasp that idea um, that sits behind all of these tactics that we'll be talking about tonight. You can see, um, if I just come out of there a little bit, you can see in the ticker tape at the bottom, um, there'll be one or two suggestions as to what we'll actually be covering in this session. So you can get a good idea of, of what to, to expect um, out of the, the coverage today. Um, so yes, with that said, a little bit about me. I'll just move my enormous head out of the way. Um, yeah, it, it kind of <laughs> I need to give you a bit of a clue as to whether it's sort of worth listening to the rest of this presentation or not, or at least give you some context as to, to where some of this stuff has come from uh, over the years. And I guess like most people, if you're fortunate enough to start fishing at a, at a young age, um, introduced to it by family members, um, principally my elder brother, uh, Ian, and also my dad. And the, the problem, the addiction, that really started um, at age six on family sort of holidays um, to places like North Wales and Cornwall in the UK. And starting out catching sort of, you know, I guess the um, the training wheels sort of species like sort of wrasse that you can catch just by fishing off rocky headlands in the sea and also uh, good gin in, in sort of the small um, canals and still waters that were easily accessible um, to me when I was when I was a kid. From those kind of, you know, the austere venues of these kind of canals, you know, moved into sort of uh, fly fishing on the what you call put, put and take fly fisheries. So the fish were stocked in, um, rainbow trout generally. And then, you know, you'd be able to catch your limit and take home, you know, whatever fish um, at the end of the day. And that was really my introduction into fly fishing. Um, somewhere around age 13, I think, when I first picked up a fly rod in anger. Um, other than sort of wafting one around in the back garden, trying to actually get the thing to cast. Um, and then, yes, moving on to bigger um, sort of water supply reservoirs um, in, in the UK. And then to some wilder waters, um, places like um, Ireland and Scotland, some of the big locks that they fish there with lots of um, 
well, a good range of traditional methods, particularly from drifting boats. And so just sort of getting the feeling really that um, it's, it's not that I'm taking one sort of thin slice view of fly fishing. It, it's sort of stuff that I've accidentally accumulated over a lot of different experiences. I mean, a lot of people can say, oh, yes, you know, I've been fishing or fly fishing for you know, 40 years. But if you basically have the same day out every time, um, so you go and you, have, you fish the same flies, you fish the same type of river, you've kind of really only got one day's experience that's been repeated um, time and time again. And uh, good friend Peter Arfield is very, very fond of, of reiterating that fact. But I think, you know, just by blind good look, really, I've been exposed, particularly again through, through my family, to lots and lots of different styles of fishing. And then with every style, sort of making connections between the different aspects of the activity. And so when it came time to kind of decide on, well, you know, how can we actually start earning money professionally? It was fairly obvious that, um, you know, a good way to do that would be to try and spend as much time as possible around rivers. And that's when I got into the sort of the more professional side of biology in, uh, in quite a big way. So I'll just bring myself back in there. So just as a quick, you know, whistle stop tour through some of that um you can see that the picture in the middle there is actually my thesis i've i've, <laughs> I've got it here simply because um <laughs> there's only ever about four people that read these things okay so you know it's, it's the <laughs> you've got to indulge me when i sort of actually uh, get people to look through these things but you know i got, got up some pretty crazy antics with that i mean these are sort of some of the um the setups that we used with with like freshwater shrimp um, exposing them to different things the the yellow tape you can see there is actually radioactive tape because i was using um, radio labeled uh, chemicals to sort of try and test some of these things um so yeah that was that was really the, the start of a more professional um aspect in in biology and then that's gone through to um you know more recent things uh where you know i've actually fairly recently uh, been involved with um, publications and textbooks and things like that on brown trout ecology um, and so again the, the print's kind of small here but I'm just mousing over some of the collaborators in the chapter in that book um, <laughs> which retails I think it, it'll set you back something like £195 or something like that for that textbook because these academic texts are super super expensive um, but uh, Jack Williams um, on the end there he's the uh, the head of science at Trout and limited so it's it's nice that you know having worked in in professional biology to be able to kind of carry through some of that advice and experience through to all different aspects of um both fly fishing and and um, you know river ecology as well and particularly trout ecology so that, that gives you a little bit of a flavor of of where some of the um, professional and the biological side comes into the interpretation of, of how we view fly fishing um, and again, on, on the right hand side here, you can just sort of see uh, Yagi Sam was kind enough to include uh, include uh, myself uh, and John in some of the stuff that they published in, in various books in Japan as well th um, through some of the, the stuff we did out there using or interpreting, you know, the fishing that we saw through this kind of um, biohacking um, approach to fly fishing. So you can pick up and use these techniques very quickly. So that's just a bit of a background from the, the professional side. Filling in some more of the, the fishing side, um, around about 2007 this is, well, I think actually this particular photo is exactly in 2007, but I wanted to make sure that I could calibrate the stuff that I was doing so that I knew that what I thought was a good approach actually stood up to, you know, proper... Um, not control, but you know, sort of benchmark tests. So it wasn't just me sort of thinking, oh, yes, I've, I've figured out a few things, so I'll write a few articles about this. So I had a bit of a go at um, river fly fishing for, for a short period of time. And as I say, mainly that was as a calibration to kind of make sure that I wasn't going wildly off track when I was sort of developing the system that we're talking about. And so this is actually the, the River Wharf at Bolton Abbey, fairly famous um, Yorkshire River. Um, if you know it at all, it's a section called Waters Meet, um, just where there's a kind of a mid-channel island where the main river splits into two. And this is the sneaking up the backside of the channel, which uh, I hope might be a bit quieter than some of the other competition water that have been fished. 
and you know fortunate enough to, to kind of get into a few fish and, and score some points which obviously you know takes the pressure off a little bit when people are watching um <laughs> i did i think i did fall over like about three times in that in that competition running between the, the sort of the fishing spots and sort of having the fish measured and that kind of thing um but uh it's all all in good fun and a very very good experience um and so again i'm not expecting you to be able to to read this at all but um Paul Page's signature at the bottom there on the score sheet. On that occasion, I was fortunate enough to to win my session, um, qualify for sort of national final and that kind of thing. And really, that was that sort of experience was enough to kind of give me a clue that I was probably onto something with um, some of the the techniques and some of the ways that I started to view fishing. That, as I say, was a bit different from what you kind of learn in a standard rote format in individual pieces of information. Now, again, it's not that those pieces of information aren't useful. It's just that you need to fit them into a framework before you can kind of really put them in the right context and understand that the, the territory around the, the immediate map that you've got. Um, so that that was, um, again, it, it, obviously it's nice for the ego. I'm not going to deny that it's like, you know, that you get a bit of a buzz out of that. But as I say, really the main thing was just making sure that I kind of knew what I was on about um, before sort of trying to tell people and teach people about some of this stuff. So if I just take my face out of the uh, the equation there, we can go on to this, which is, again, it's the first meaty bit of biology before we get on to some of the fly fishing case studies and some of the videos on stream. But this is a really classic experiment, and it, I hope it puts a bit of an, another nail into the coffin of the idea of like needing super, super close copy patterns um, to fool fish. And this is going into the, you know, the real zoology and the biology of visual predators and how that how they sort of work. So you can see toads, you know, they eat um, worms and mealworms and, and things that are generally sort of longer um, than they are tall. And they kind of move in this lateral um, direction. And you can see that these, these toads are actually striking at those um, prey images as if they were real prey. But notice when you, you put that sort of essentially a matchstick vertical, there's absolutely zero response um, whatsoever. So on the one hand, the cue that represents food is very, very, very simple. But you don't have to tweak it much before, you know, those uh, that predator, in that case a toad, totally, totally ignores it. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm absolutely certain that I'm not the only one that's seen that same expression that you see on the toad that's not responding, that kind of just, you know, the complete ignoring of the fly that you've put in front of that fish. Um, it's the same response. And that's because the prey image isn't quite right to convince it that what you're offering it is food. But at the same time, how simple you can refine and trim down that prey image to actually convince that predator to strike at that as if it were food. So in, in the toad's case, that you know that sort of matchstick shape, as long as it's kind of parallel to the ground and moving lengthways, um, it'll strike at it. Which is it's a long way from sort of counting the tails on numbers of you know uh, on um, that you put on dry flies and how many turns of rib that you put on and that kind of thing. Um, so that that's really what I'm sort of driving at with this uh, you know this really um, trim down and slim down uh, approach to sort of fly fishing imitation. Um, so just, you know, to kind of hammer that home a little bit, if you remember from the first session, um, the sort of biohacking first session that we did, I talked about a bit of an epiphany that I had reading some articles by um, Stuart Crofts and David Calvert back in the day. And this is kind of early 2000s. And they talked in that um, about this kind of using different densities of dressing of flies in different kinds of water. So they're using skinny flies in sort of flat water and then bushier, um, more straggly flies. This is dry fly fishing um, in the sort of the riffled and rippled and broken water. But as well as that, another main, main thing that they concentrated on in those articles was this idea of... Um, they use this general impression size and shape. So it's really this, the really suggestive and impressionistic kind of fly dressing. And the way that I've kind of, you know, a good shorthand that I've put uh, for this here is, is uh, it's actually um, based on Picasso's uh, drawing of a bull. Now, OK, none of us are going to be fooled into thinking that's a real animal. But even before I actually sort of, you know, spoke about the fact or within within the, a split second of you seeing that image, you understood 
both the species and also the sex of that animal that's being represented. And that's a kind of a just a, a pre-conscious um, recognition. You've no choice but to kind of recognize that as soon as you see it, even before you can kind of, you know, vocalize or verbalize it or, or actually think about it rationally. And that's the effect that we're aiming to get with um, our fly patterns, really. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's that thing of um, really not going over the top with the impression or with, with the imitation to make it photorealistic. It's understanding when you're at the point where there's nothing left to take away. That, that's perfect. Not when there's nothing more to add um, to a fly. So that's really the, the kind of the, the aesthetic that we're going for. And so much so that, um, you know, you can think of all of the famous, famous fish catching flies that you can name. Generally, the ones that stand the, te stand the test of time, they're not the ones that are these photorealistic copies. Now, it's a fantastic and artistic, you know, thing to do is, tie, you know, tying close copy flies is amazing. Um, I'm certainly not dissing that. But in terms of catching fish and having reliable patterns that will really do it for you, you know, things like Czech nymphs, um, they're, they're impressionistic, they're not um, close copy. And something we'll come back to a little bit later on is that, you know, they also incorporate these exaggerations as well, like the sort of the hot spots and things like that, that actually trigger an even stronger response. And that's, that's really all part of this kind of biological approach to fly fishing as well. So yeah, Czech nymphs, you know, whoever won a competition with Czech nymphs, oh, okay, the entire Czech world team. So, you know, they're pretty tried and tested uh, in a whole range of, you know, guises that, that, they, uh, that they come in as fly patterns. Again, all-time classic dry fly, you know, LK caddis. Um, you're not going to be fooled putting that as a human next to a real caddis and thinking that it's, it's a real fly. But my word, is it effective when you fish it? for you know trout and grayling and whatever the species feeding on caddis you know it's it's a perfect kind of uh, simplification of that uh, prey image that those visual predators the fish are actually using same again i mean how many variations of uh, a pheasant tail nymph can you uh, can you name i mean this <laughs> There's there's probably more than almost any other kind of fly, and at the same time, they're not close copy things. None of them are close copy pheasant tails, but you know all of them work in the right application. Whether it's a sort of a modern incarnation, like a, you know a beadhead version here, or the, you know the original versions that Frank Sawyer tied as well, phenomenally effective and reliable pattern. Um, you just can't go wrong, really, and in, in, you know if the, if the size is right, <laughs> broadly speaking, for what the fish are feeding on uh, subsurface. It's an amazing pattern, and it's very, very simple. Same again. I mean, how old are these patterns? You know, the traditional North Country spiders, and you know, very, very similar tradition with the soft hackles you get in America as well. You're not going to be, you know, convincing anybody by saying that these are close copy patterns. But they just batter fish wherever you use them, as long as you've got a good um, strategy for matching those flies to what that predator wants to see. So it's really, you know, just trying to hammer home that pretty much any of the most successful fly patterns that you can name, you know, so many of them are these multitasking sort of suggestive patterns that cover a multitude of sins. Um, and that's really, you know, it. It crops up too often to ignore, really, and it's something that, you know, if nothing else from these sessions, it's definitely something to take home and sort of, you know, to, to make sure that you incorporate it in your own fishing. You're also, you know, if, you, if something takes, um, you know, sort of a couple of minutes to tie, you're a lot less worried about putting it in a bush as well, so you can aim for some of those more difficult-to-reach fish without worrying that you're going to, you know, something that's taking you 45 minutes to tie, you're going to be a bit more circumspect about. So it has a kind of a practical application as well in that sense. And the, uh, again, moving out of the way a little bit here, that idea of the simplified prey image and the way that visual predators refine that, I go into that and the evidence for that in some detail in the third out of the bonus um, biohacker email tutorials. And you can see in there, some just a thin slice, it's very simple, it's not really heavy um, text or anything, but it's a very simple demonstration of where some of these um, pieces of evidence come from not only in terms of visual predators recognizing food 
uh, but also how they refine that ability so they get better at it. But importantly as well, also the occasions where they make mistakes and and that's super important as well because really when fly fishing we're, we're looking to to help sort of predators make mistakes and actually mistake our artificial um, food for the real thing so if you want to get a little bit more into that do go ahead and uh, click the link on the uh, the title or just under the title of this video um, wherever you see it, whether it's embedded on the blog and in the replay or the live one there'll be a link to those um, bonus tutorials that you can get hold of as well um, so yeah this brings us really trying to combine a few things together the holy grail of some of this stuff is the idea that it started as a very small kind of thin end of the wedge kind of spark of an idea but it's something that I've really run with and through sort of working with John Pearson and other people you know there's too many you know top anglers to name really refining this approach over the years but the, the heart of it the, the touchstone of it is this idea of signal to noise ratio now what the hell does that mean well I'll tell you a quick story about it at least. Um, early on when I was working for the Wild Trout Trust, I found myself at quite a posh sort of do um, talking to one of the trustees of the Wild Trout Trust. And he'd had a background in the defence industry. And one of the things he was talking about that he'd sort of worked on as part of the teams that he was involved with was this idea of um, missile detection systems um, in the, in the defence scenario. And it's very, very important when you're developing those systems that your system can detect the important signal, which, which is the bit of data that you're interested in, i.e. the thing that's actually sort of, you know, blasting towards the target that's posing an immediate danger. You need to be able to pick that out of a data stream from the background in which it's actually occurring. So a missile might be skidding quite low, close to the surface of the sea, for example, how mathematically do you tease apart those two things? Because you definitely don't want to be confusing one with the other. And it's relatively easy. I mean, you know, for these people that are good at this sort of stuff, it's relatively easy to do that when there's a big difference between the strength of the signal and a low background noise, like a calm sea. But it gets more difficult, much, much more difficult when there's far more background noise added into the equation. And that means that there's less separation of the data that's really useful, the information that you're interested in, and that background scenario. And that's really absolutely critical, and it ties together so many things, particularly in river fly fishing, but it also applies in all sorts of fishing as well. Um, so very, very keen to sort of, you know, to kind of um, embed that as an idea within everything that we're talking about here. Um, and so just to bring myself back in again there, in fly fishing terms, the background noise is really everything that's not the food that you want the fish to be interested in. Apart from the other thing that is a signal is your own presence as a potential predator. So you're really wanting to minimise that predator signal so that it blends into the background, being part of the background noise, and you want to kind of maximise uh, within reason the strength of the signal of your fly, which is representing something that's recognisable as food. And so that understanding how you play with that ratio, that's what allows you to rock up to a completely new venue and understand intuitively what flies to use, how to present them and where to present them. Um, and that it, it's a simple rule that explains so much when you kind of get into it and start unpacking it. Um, and it's, it's really, again, just harking back to that sort of early 2000s series of articles by Calvert and Crofts, as well as the, the sort of the riffles and the bushy flies and the flat water skinny flies, which is that's talking about signal to noise, it's bringing in that simplified prey image thing as well. And so the system that we're sort of, you know, that developing and, and sort of helping to share with you in these sessions, it combines those two things and that's what gives you the cues on what to use. So you, you don't have to rely on... Um, the magazine that you've just read actually being exactly appropriate to the conditions you find on stream because obviously fish and the weather don't don't read the magazines or the calendars um they're, they're sort of doing whatever they please so you need to be able to interpret the conditions that you find on your own fishing day um so that's you know a super super critical part of being consistently a bit more successful than average um so yeah this 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 here uh trying to combine those ideas in, in a good sort of on stream demonstration um, 
we can take a look at some of the stuff that we shot fairly recently. This is the back end of this trout season. And this is really a fish capture using very, very small streamer pattern, um, using a rod and reel, um, which might be a surprise to some of you if you've seen sort of some of our Tinkara stuff before, but presenting a small streamer on a French leader setup. Now, the system that we're talking about in terms of background noise and simple images, this that has guided everything, every choice that I've made in this little section of fishing. It's guided the fact that I'm kneeling down instead of standing up. It's guided the fact that I'm kneeling in the broken water, not in the flat water, and I'm fishing downstream as a result of that. And it's also guided the design and the size of the streamer that I'm using in those low water, fairly bright, spooky conditions. Um, and it's a lovely, lovely little wild trout. And it's, you know, it might not be the biggest um, specimen trout in the world. But as with all these things, I'm very, very happy catching fish of that size when they're wild. They've earned a place in the stream, like little jewels almost, or sort of little songbirds. Um, really, really privileged to have those kind of close-up encounters with those fish uh, and then to release them back to where they came from. But as I say, everything within that um, whole presentation, that was entirely decided by looking at the signal-to-noise ratio and using that to guide the choice of fly, so the strength of the signal that I'm giving out with the fly, and then also the degree to which I had to kind of kill my presence and reduce my presence so I blended into the background noise. And that's the, that's the non-sexy side of fly fishing, that ability to play with background noise and make sure that you're not putting out signals of being a predator, whilst at the same time making sure you're making very, very good offerings to the fish in the in the shape of these um, flies that represent a prey image that they notice and they readily accept and that's all based on this kind of you know the, the whole approach that ties it all together so part of that being stealthy um, and, and blending into the background noise part of that uh, revolves around uh, the range that you're fishing at so there's there's several things obviously in flatter water you need to be more stealthy so in this shot uh, actually in the Czech Republic I'm, I'm actually kneeling down there again uh, it's not that I'm standing in thigh deep water the water itself uh, that I'm that I'm kneeling in is is maybe six inches deep and I'm just fishing just over the edge into a drop off that's maybe a couple of feet deep um, so that's that's again as part of playing with that sort of um, stealth and the background noise uh, and the ratio of, of the strength of my signal as a potential predator to the available background noise. And you know during that trip we had a fantastic trip. You'll see some more photos and some more just kind of basic fish porn from myself and John from from that trip. It's a good few years ago now, um, where we sort of you know we had a really enjoyable trip, uh, employed a variety of techniques, and were able to turn up um, to rivers. And sort of sight read them and have good success, which is, you know, it's a nice satisfying activity to be involved with. Again, here's another example. A lot of people uh, are surprised when you can catch fish on very, very short line nymphing techniques. Um, with grayling, you know, it's possible. People are quite used to the fact that on occasion you can walk very close to grayling. But oftentimes people are surprised that trout will also be catchable underneath your rod tip. And the critical thing here in this photo, and the reason I've included it, is that the, the fish in, the, in, that was caught from that exact spot um, a few seconds after that photo was taken, the only reason I was able to do that directly under the rod tip is the fact that I've placed broken water between myself and where my flies were fishing. And so I was able to drop my flies in a very controlled way in a, in a fantastic area, which is the seam between the fast and the slow water, but I was able to do that from behind a curtain of broken water. And so I could stand right on top of that trout. It's a basic thing, a lot of people do it unconsciously, but when you start to try and teach this formally, it's good to know the reasons behind it so that you can actually re reproduce that and get the same results for other people. So you don't have to, again, learn dry facts. You learn a principle and then you can apply it generally. So that's, again, it's just another easy and simple um, example of how this ratio of signal to noise is so important. Because I'm standing in an area where the background noise is much stronger, it means I have to be a lot less careful about concealing my presence and I can get really close to the fish without disturbing them. And nobody's ever caught a spooked fish. You know, as soon as they spook off, 
it's not looking at a fly. Yes, it might come back on station, might come back on feed in 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, depending on the review fishing. But you know that during that time when you've actually spooked it, you can forget about it. And so yeah, that that was the nice result from that sort of uh, little escapade there, and you know multiple other um, captures that we we're fortunate to to have on that same session. Again, this idea of range and stealth and how you actually achieve that, um, some of that comes in, in some of the tips and things in the extra emails. But this is just a shot of John in some fairly flat water, again using a rod and reel, using a French leader setup, with a little bit more separation between himself and the water and the fish that he's targeting. Um, because between where his feet are and where the fish are potentially, he hasn't really got that curtain of broken water to hide behind. So that's why he's kind of extended that reach a bit. Importantly as well, he's got that high rod tip so that he hasn't even got the splash down of the line landing on the water. And that's important as well because splashes, they may, as a minimum, they may distract the fish and cause them to look away from where your fly is. But there's a good chance that they'll actually treat that as a potential predator and you'll spook fish as well. So that's why we don't want fly lines slapping down right on the heads of the fish that we're trying to catch. You can go to fairly extreme lengths um, with some of these you know, French leader setups. You don't often have to do this, um, but you can see in the highlighted circle, um, that's actually where John's indicator is. Um, and then again, he's holding as much of that leader as he can under those circumstances off the water to minimize the resistance that the fish feels and, and the resistance that is experienced when he strikes to set the hook. Uh, but at the same time as well, he's reducing that kind of splashy effect that you might get of a fly line touching down. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that is another example of, of playing with the, the background noise or, or being uh, aware of and using um, the background noise to signal ratio so that you can present your, your flies to fish without spooking them. And I've got a little short example again here from uh, one of my local rivers. And this is really one that um, it kind of really highlights everything I've been talking about, both in terms of the strength of the signal of the flies, but also minimizing the strength of the signal as me as a predator. So I'm actually, I've deliberately placed those rocks between myself and the fish that I'm aiming at. The water I'm fishing into is about calf depth maybe. It's very, very shallow, it's very flat. And I'm actually even preventing the indicator from landing on the water as far as possible. So I've only got tip it in the water as far as I can manage, um, especially with those first few exploratory casts. That was, you know, really, really satisfying. It's probably the f the first sort of few casts of the actual the entire session that we had on that uh, on that day when we went out filming. And again, it's not an enormous fish, but it really serves to illustrate the point that I'm making. You can see as well the fish were continuing to rise after I'd caught that uh, first fish as well, and that's really important. That minimally invasive sort of way of being able to present the flies. And that and part of that, a huge part of that, is really minimizing um, the strength of that signal um, that I'm putting out as a potential predator in that flat water. So I'm using that slightly faster water at the downstream end of the, of the pool and the rocks that were placed between myself um, and the, the fish that I was targeting. So again, there's two aspects to signal to noise ratio, as well as being stealthy in the flat water and and showing the you know one of the ways that you can achieve that with that French nymphing outfit. The other aspect as well was I didn't need to go very big at all with the flies. In fact, these are really tiny flies. These are kind of well on the scale of most people's fly box. They're sort of size twenties and twenty ones. Um, with uh, the the tungsten beads are sort of maybe one point five milli. The smallest ones I could get my hands on in my tying kit basically. And just to highlight that, we actually, we, when we went for that filming session, we'd actually dropped in behind another angler that was just leaving. And the very start of his session, which was maybe a couple of hours before we were there, um, he'd been targeting the same fish, um, but using a fly line. And he'd, he'd, um, he'd not got the sort of the, the, the French leader um, set up in, in his armory. And he was actually touching the fly line down on the water. And he wasn't able to get the fish to come to his flies. And, and the flies he were using were, were a little bit larger as well. And he tried a variety of things. He tried some dry flies as well as nymphs. Um, again, I could equally have, have been using really quite nice, small dry flies on that same rig um, and would have expected to have some, some good success as well. But it's just that, that little last bit of video, it really serves a really nice illustration of 
turning down the strength of the signal, both in your flies and your own presence on stream when there's low background noise available. Um, and it, you know, it really paid off on that in that particular session. We were able to demonstrate some very useful things in, in what all the other stuff that we filmed on that same day. Um, it really tied into that whole uh, sort of concept really nicely. So again, we're just with some more um, tales and stories of experiences that we've had and using this, this sort of system um, to turn up to strange, or well, at least to us, you know, new rivers and then apply them and, and be confident and have some success with it. So I think this is in 2012, myself and John uh, visiting the Czech Republic um, for, I can't remember, second or third time, something like that. Um, and this is fishing on, on rivers like the Tepla Voltava and also the Otava as well. Really, really nice rivers. And it's kind of mile after mile of these um, meandering, crystal clear, very rich sort of chalk stream like conditions um, that are just very, that it's ideal for sort of grayling habitat. Um, there's, there's plenty of trout there as well, but you know, um, they're, they're really, really sort of a haven for European grayling. So it's a, you know, just a wonderful place to go and um, try out techniques because you can often see the fish that you're targeting as well. So, you know, it gives you a lot of feedback on the methods that you're using. And there's, there's no end of sort of, you know, pods of grayling of this size that you can target and experiment with. And they see quite a few good anglers as well. So you need to be kind of on your game to, to kind of be successful on a consistent basis. Um, and so we were finding that often... Uh, when it warmed up in the afternoons, we were using dry flies and fishing downstream to them was far, far more effective than fishing upstream. And that's, you know, it's a, a classic sort of method. Um, we added some tweaks to it, which I'll not go into in this particular session, but we were able to extend the length of the drift uh, with the tackle that we were using um, with extra long rods and the sort of the light sort of casting lines that we were using. And that was very successful. But in the mornings when it was cool and there wasn't much hatching, then, you know, it was classic sort of Czech nymphing and French nymphing territory. And again, I've, <laughs> I've used this size of the slide a few times, and that's probably as close to a beaming smile as you'll get from John, but uh, you'll have to trust me on that. He was very, very happy with the, uh, the results and the captures that we experienced on that particular trip. And again, it's just, you know, if you ever get the chance to fish those rivers, they're absolutely fabulous places. Um, and they really, really respond well to this kind of system that we're building up and, and talking about in these series of, of tutorials and online sessions. Another, just to try to, I'm trying to make some of these examples relatable. So I've obviously had some from home streams that are very close to where, you know, I live and sort of fish routinely. Um, and then some pretty, you know, um, recognizable destinations, even if they're slightly under the radar. One fantastic place that we've been very lucky to fish recently, um, it maps exactly onto the river systems that were used in the 2018 uh, World Fly Fishing Championship. So I thought that was, you know, a nice relevant um, touchstone. It's also pretty much next to, it sort of neighbours um, directly with Slovenia, which is just here on the map. Um, so when you picture those kind of cobalt blue rivers and the mountain ranges and those kind of rivers, that's a pretty accurate picture of the sorts of rivers that you're going to find in this area. And so some wonderful memories from you know fishing in, in these streams. Um, and again, if I just back out of that picture, you can get an idea of the stunning surroundings that you can expect um, when you go and visit this uh, this part of the world. Full of, of trout, um, brook trout, um, some marble trout in certain spots. Um, slightly lower downstream on the systems than this, you'll tend to get grayling as well. Um, so a wonderful range of species um, to target and with a whole range of methods, you know, um, that's the wonderful thing about the stuff we're talking about, that biological approach, it cross cuts all different sorts of methods. It doesn't make you hide bound to one particular approach. It helps you get better at any approach that you want to sort of perfect and learn. And again, a good props to this guy, Vito, fantastic fella. And uh, he certainly sorted us out with, uh, with all of the fishing experiences that, that we've had over in, in that part of the world. Obviously, for being from Italy himself, you know, he's a fantastic um, font of knowledge and really, really, you know, just a terrific um, boon to have been able to to sort of benefit from the stuff that he's passed on and the, the contacts and uh, all the people he's introduced us to. So big thanks to Vito. He's a fantastic guy, um, knows a lot of people, so there's a decent chance you, if you've not met him yet, you, <laughs> if you're in the fly fishing world, you'll probably come across him at some point because he's a very gregarious fellow and he's, he's a fantastic dude. 
Um, practical joker as well. So do be aware if you go away on a trip with him, <laughs> particularly if you want to keep your eyebrows. Um, <laughs> But yeah, just just recounting some experiences that these these um, techniques have given us and this approach has given us. Here's one example of the you know kind of um, sort of uh, the coloration on some of the brown trout. This this is actually off the River Sarka, which was um, featured in. There's actually some really good articles at the moment by Howard Croston in Fly Fishing and Fly Tying, which is a UK magazine, and he's talking about his experiences in the World Championships in Italy, and he mentions a fairly famous tributary that that washes this kind of slightly whitish, milky um, suspension, so that the normally absolutely crystal clear water carries a slight tinge to it. Um, on some days, it's a bit stronger as well. It just depends on what's happening on this particular tributary. However, this is on the mainstream and it wasn't particularly milky on, on that uh, day when we were fishing it. But even so, there was extra water in the river and there'd been some previous rainfall. So that clued me into using a much larger fly than I would do in, much, in, in very, very low and low background noise and low water conditions. And this was allowing me to pull fish from much further away as well. And that's an important aspect of this biological approach, the idea of calories in and calories out. Um, this particular fish, when I, when I set the hook on it, it actually bolted from the pool that it was in and ran straight up a flume of water that was squeezed between two boulders and then leapt about a dozen times in the pool upstream of these rocks. And I'm sort of frantically trying to follow it with my rod tip as high as possible. Um, quite, <laughs> quite an exciting and quite an exhilarating experience. Um, a very memorable fish and a really beautiful fish as well at that. Um, I happened to be using a tenkara rod at the time, but as I say, um, the tactics that I chose were really shaped by the biological sort of um, yardsticks and the, and the uh, benchmarks that I'm sort of trying to develop in these tutorials. Um, so I could equally have used any other fly fishing approach, but I would have I would have made similar tactical choices to the rig that I then built with that um, that system of fishing. And again, on the same occasion, um, the it's just this is a really good example, actually, of um, one of the the hybrids between the marble trout that you get there and also the Mediterranean strain of brown trout. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a shame that the, that the marble trout are, are kind of being hybridized out of existence in some condi in some situations, but at the same time. You know, all these strains of trout that, that live and breed in these streams are just stunning examples. Um, just really, really uh, privileged to kind of to, to hook up and catch some of these fish, um, take a quick photograph and then slip them back. Um, so, yeah, wonderful, wonderful um, fishing experiences and great memories. Um, and it's this sort of thing that having that reliable and predictable um, methods that will give you several um, approaches that, that are good bets, you know, better than average tactics. It gives you more and more chances to have experiences like this on new rivers. So it's, it's a real privilege to be able to go and, and visit some of these places and, and have these kind of memories that, that come from the trips. Again, this one um, is sort of a real leopard spotted uh, brown trout. It's caught on the same day, but a little bit further upstream and in a spot where the water was a bit clearer as well. Um, it's in a section that is largely very, very shallow, but there's the occasional deeper spot that forms behind some of the boulders that, that create sort of a scour hole in the, in the faster and deeper, uh, sorry, the more powerful spate flows when there's more water coming down the river. So I'd, even though most of the river was quite shallow with low background noise, I actually chose that large fly still because where I was actually targeting fish, it was still a deeper water and turbulent environment where there was plenty of background noise that I wanted to kind of stand out um, against with my fly. And then obviously using as much cover as possible to, to conceal my own presence so that the, the shallow water um, that I was working around, I wasn't spooking fish from that into the lies that I actually wanted to fish. Um, and that's, you know, again, a lovely, lovely um, fish that f fought amazingly hard and just in, in a stunning, stunning surroundings. And just, you know, kind of had that mile wide grin um, at the end of, of the day, sort of, you know, catching these fish all day long with great company. And then going back to a hotel with great beer and great food as well. So, yeah, just just really, really wonderful memories. And this is again, this is an example of how the rig is really the delivery system. So if you understand what you're trying to achieve, 
with um, your tactics, the interaction between the fish and the fly, it's kind of independent of the method you're using. So I've actually got a Tenkara, a Japanese Tenkara level line attached to the end of a floating fly line. So I'm using it in exactly the same way that I would a French leader. Only on the end of that, there's just a single fly and it's a single Japanese kibari, a Japanese fly pattern. And I'm actually using a specific named Japanese manipulation technique as well. And one of the two of the key things, one is that the high rod tip is allowing me to keep that line off the water and avoiding the spooking fish by splashing the water. But the other reason I was able to hook that fish was that I'd placed the riverbank and the rocks and all the things that were providing cover between myself and the point where my, where my fly was landing. So this is a very, very Japanese Tenkara approach, but it's applied purely using Western fly rod and reel. So again, it, the tactics that you use are really independent of the particular tackle that you happen to be holding at the time. And as I say, just to keep stressing over and over again, it's the interaction between the fish and the fly and also you as an angler and the fish. You know, you don't want to be in that equation as far as the fish is concerned. And that's what we're sort of trying to sort of uh, to embed with the lessons that we're trying to give um, in this this section of or this session or sequence rather <laughs> can't speak this sequence of tutorials that we're putting together online. So this approach it's worked very well and it's helped us to interpret some of the excellent anglers and the techniques that we've learned in Japan and added to our arsenal. The overall kind of biological biohacker approach, it's worked really well there and it's helped us to learn those techniques more quickly than we would have done otherwise. It's worked in Devon and this, you know, just a daft list of all the places where we've gone and just turned up and it's allowed us to reliably and predictably catch fish. You know, these are rivers that are quite close to where I live, uh, but also kind of, you know, doing sort of... Uh, southern raiding trips down to the hallowed chalk streams where you know these particularly tenkara or whatever you know these are the sort of modern maybe nymphing techniques or whatever where they're allowed um you know lots of people kind of a bit sniffy about it and oh that wouldn't work on my stream kind of an attitude well i can tell you it absolutely does work on there there's a lot of people using this sort of approaches and you'll see it working on all sorts of you know rivers in the usa in Ireland, um, again, Greater Manchester, some of the post-industrial recovering rivers that we've got in the UK as well. It's a reliable, predictable way of giving yourself that edge, um, particularly compared to the more traditional way of learning fly fishing. And again, just to hammer that home, all of these different ways of fishing it, it's not that I'm saying, oh, you need to fish tenkara, or you need to fish dry fly, or you need to fish wet fly, whatever it is. You need to understand the interaction between the visual predator that's a fish and how it's interpreting your fly. So it cuts across all of these different methods. And when you look at it like that, all of those methods are simply delivery systems for the impression that you want to give to those fish. And that the physical rigs themselves either help or hinder you achieving that. But if you don't understand the effect that you're needing to have with that simple fly, you're going to struggle because you're going to have to learn things by rote. You're going to have to learn each technique sort of just fact by fact, you know, dry fact and dry brick by dry brick and try and stick them together. And as soon as the conditions change a little bit or it goes outside of the, the normal situation, you find yourself lost very quickly without a map. So, yeah, I'm really, really stressing that what I'm talking about here is absolutely universally applicable to pretty much any fly fishing that you're going to do, you know, including sort of uh, still water lock style fishing as well. It absolutely clues you into the tactics that can help you sort of have consistent success there as well. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> we've probably all heard the, you know, the, the more famous quote, opinions like ourselves, in, in as much everyone's got one. But Tim Minchin added a genius bit to that, which is, unlike ourselves, we should constantly and thoroughly examine our own opinions. And this is aimed at basically all the people that kind of, you know, that come across, oh, you fish French nymphing, that's, not, you know, if I'd ban you from my sort of waters, it's not fly fishing, or in Tenkara's just fishing with a bream buster, or it's cane pole fishing that we used to do for $2, and blah, 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 blah. That is kind of nonsense, really, if it, <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. You either sort of understand the finer uh, aspects of it, and, and believe you me, to cast a Tenkara rod properly is more difficult than casting a Western fly rod. 
straight up and i'm happy to have that discussion with anybody who disagrees with that um and i'm happy to have that discussion in person on stream i've even put some joke videos out of you know sort of throwing some um respectable casting loops with a western fly rod and fly line and that's still to my mind and and my experience that's still easier than casting the lighter level lines that you get in tank tank car and doing that properly so i'm happy to argue anybody um on that on that point what I'm saying is don't try and be smart just by dismissing things. And that's the easiest way to try and look smart, but actually you're often just being closed minded. And that's the thing. You need to constantly re-examine these things if you're not to be stagnant in your fishing. And being stagnant, there's no space for growth and development. And for me, that means you're losing interest and motivation to kind of to keep going back. And it gets a bit stale if you're not careful. So yeah, please, please do try and have that sort of um continual student sort of mindset where you're eager to learn new things because it brings so much to your fishing experience on stream and yeah just to bring it back again to this this um the whole idea that i'm hanging this stuff on um before we get to the next sort of session it's that biological hacking idea um you know manipulating the fish's responses in a predictable way based on its biology and this is the one big idea, you know, again, that um, learning the tactics just by rote and going for trying to make the most realistic fly possible. It's not the fastest way to understanding how to predictably have success on stream. And instead, there are just a much smaller number of general rules that come from understanding a little bit about the behavior and the biology of fish. And it's that idea and trying to sort of pass on that biohacking approach that hopefully some, you know, a lot of these case studies that, that we're putting forward will give you just a lot more confidence with on stream and a lot more success as well. And you don't have to be battering fish to enjoy this approach. You know, if you have a bit more understanding, it just gives you a better appreciation of your day on stream and nature and the surroundings as well. Um, so that's really that. But what about reading the water? We've talked about, you know, uh, presenting these things and maybe a little touched on selecting some of the flies that you might use and approaching them. But how the hell do you know where to actually start on a new river? Well, that's really going to be the focus of the next session, the next live session that we're having uh, in just a couple of days time. Um, again, you'll get more information about the scheduling of that in uh, the extra biohacker lessons. But on top of that, you will also get, as I say, some of the data and the information that sits behind the evidence or the proof behind where these ideas come from and where they've been tested. Um, and if you want, if you're the kind of person that know, needs to know or likes to know how things work, those extra lessons give you uh, exactly that. They're, they're separate from our regular sort of free tutorial lessons that teach techniques um, step by step. Um, and there's, there's just a short number of lessons that are associated with this, this kind of sequence of uh, tutorials that we're building online. The next one, as I say more next, the next session that we're going to run, um, we're focusing, as I say, on uh, reading the water uh, a little bit, um, but also some of the, again, some more fish captures and um, sort of proof of the pudding in, in that respect as well. A little bit of a demonstration on that. Um, so, yeah, really, really looking and uh, oh, <laughs> again, the technology had to fail at some point. But, yeah, just focusing in on um, reading the water, using the structure uh, that you've got available to you so that you can use it like that sheet music that musicians interpret and understand at a gut level where you position yourself and where you need to position your flies to be presenting it to fish, even when you can't see those fish. Um, you know, directly by, by sort of stalking them. So that's really the focus of, of uh, the next session that we'll be doing in a couple of days' time. Do please feel free to tune in on that. If you've got any questions on this se session, um, whether you're seeing it live or whether you're seeing it on the replay, feel free to drop those questions and comments in. Um, we'll do our best to jump on and answer those as quickly as we can. Um, so that's, yeah, please do sort of feel free to interact and, and sort of uh, give you feedback on that. I'd be delighted to receive it. So with that, um, I think what I'll do is just sign off to thank you very much for watching. Um, and to just, just to add a reminder as well, do go ahead if you want to get the extra details, sign up to the extra tutorials. You'll get a lot more value out of it and we'll catch you in the next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>